Welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to be checking out the FineView GX1000 dash camera made by Fine Digital in South Korea. The GX1000 is a two channel quad high definition front and rear dash camera using a Sony Starvis IMX335 image sensor in both the front and rear dash cameras. It includes a built in GPS receiver, Wi Fi support for 2.4 GHz Wi Fi connections, a variety of parking modes. It includes advanced driver assistance features, high dynamic range support for both cameras, battery discharge prevention by monitoring the input voltage and turning off the dash camera when the input voltage gets too low. You'll save space on the micro SD card by allowing the use of the smart time lapse feature in both driving and parking modes, and a variety of other things. In this video, I'll go through what's in the box, a detailed overview of the features, power consumption information, sample footage, and hopefully at the end, you'll know if this dash camera is the one for you. So let's get into it. This video contains several video chapters. If there's one of particular interest to you, jump to the time index listed on the screen here, or expand the video description section and click on the link down there. Hope you enjoy the video. Now let's take a look at what's inside the box of the FindView GX1000. Here we have the passenger side compartment view of the front camera. On the left side, we have the record mic button or it's button A in the documentation. Below that is LED A. And on the right side, we have the Wi-Fi button, which is referred to as button B. And below that is the LED B. Button A, if you do a quick press of that, that will initiate a manual recording, which will appear in the camcorder directory on the micro SD. A long press of that button of 1.5 seconds will result in the toggling of the audio recording, turning on and off the audio recording feature. A quick press of the Wi-Fi button will toggle the Wi-Fi feature on or off. A press of the button for three seconds will reinitialize the Wi-Fi configuration and a long press of both the record mic button and the Wi-Fi button for a total of three seconds will initiate a formatting of the micro SD card file system. Here's a look at the front of the GX1000. In the lower left corner, we have the security LED, which can be configured and how it operates in the firmware settings. And then we have the adjustable front camera lens, which has a notched adjustment mechanism. On the rear edge of the GX1000, the Wi-Fi toggle is on the left-hand side, which provides the Wi-Fi connectivity for the device. The smaller connection port is for the rear camera cable. And then on the very right, you have the DC-in, which is the 12 volt three wire capable connection port for the power for the GX1000. Here's the side of the GX1000 that faces the windshield. I have removed the cradle joint, which is actually adhered to the windshield and it slides on and off of the GX1000 by sliding the camera unit to the left and it will detach from the cradle unit. One thing I wish uh, that FindView would change in the future is the product information label, including the product serial number, is on the label there on the right, which is visible from outside the vehicle. Here's a picture of the GX1000 installed on my windshield. You can see that the rear camera cable, I've taken the straight connection and plugged it into the GX1000. You can actually plug in the straight connection or the 90 degree angle connection here, depending on which best suits your needs for the installation. Here's a picture of the GX1000 installed on the front windshield using the cradle joint to connect it to the windshield. And again, you can see that the information label is visible from the outside of the vehicle. Here's a picture of the GX1000 rear camera installed on the window glass. It can be adjusted up and down based on a notch adjustment system. And then from the outside, you can see the camera lens and to the right of the camera lens is the security LED. Here are the additional items in the box for the GX1000 a three wire hardwiring cable, a 32 gigabyte micro SD card, a replacement adhesive pad for the front and rear camera, and four wiring clips. If you would like to power using a cigarette lighter adapter, that is an optional accessory, and FindView also is coming out with a FindView OBD2 port powering option for the GX1000 as well. And lastly, we have the FindView GX1000 Quick Start Guide and Warranty Manual. An additional feature about the GX1000, it actually has a physical on-off slide switch. When in the on position, it prevents the removal of the micro SD card. To remove it, you have to slide it to the off position, which turns off the dash camera. And then you press and click to 
remove the micro SD card and then you do the reverse to put it back in place and turn on the power to the camera again. I'm now going to compare the dash camera features of the FindView GX1000 with what I consider to be a direct competitor of this particular product, which is the Viofo A229 Duo. They both have very similar hardware configurations, but they have different ways of dealing with driving, recording, and parking mode. So I figure I'd go through a feature comparison here over this page, and there's a following page. I'm not going to cover each one of these items in depth in the video. If you would like to check out each one in more in depth, pause the video so you have more time to read each one. One thing I wanted to note is the image sensor is the same with both dash cameras. Both the front and rear cameras for each dash camera is the same Sony Starvis IMX335 image sensor. In the video resolution section, I wanted to point out that the GX1000 has a smart time lapse feature. It also has that in the parking mode configuration, but the smart time lapse is something that will help you save space and it records at six frames per second. When an impact does occur during normal driving mode, it will actually create a buffered impact event recording of 20 seconds. So it does not stop the smart time lapse video in that particular case. That continues, so it records both of them in parallel. If you've selected standard or 15 frames per second for the GX1000 in driving recording mode, when an impact occurs, the currently active video file is stopped and an impact video is created, which includes 10 seconds before the impact event and 10 seconds after the impact event. And when that completes, a new driving recording mode video file is created. The same general behavior is true of the GX1000 parking modes. If an impact occurs within the smart time-lapse parking mode, the smart time-lapse video continues to record and an impact video is created at the same time. If you have selected motion or 15 frames per second, which is also a motion-based parking mode, and there's actually an event to trigger that particular mode, so it's recording a 20 second video for that particular motion event, and an impact occurs in the same time, it will terminate the current motion recording and create an impact recording. This behavior is described on the 5 view website as absolute parking mode. So it's not a parking mode of its own, it's how it's handling the impacts while in parking mode, and as we've seen in normal driving mode as well. On this page, I'd like to point out in the video codec section that both dash cameras use H.264 to encode the video content on both the front and rear cameras by default. The format in which they're written to the disc is different. The Viofa A229 takes a more traditional approach in creating a separate MP4 file that has the encoded video stream, audio, and GPS information for the front and rear cameras. The FindView GX1000 takes a different approach by creating an AVI file which has the front video stream, the rear video stream, the audio track, and the GPS information all in one AVI file and writes that in one minute segments on the micro SD card. You'll see that in the file name, there'll be an F and an R in the file name for the GX1000. And that indicates that both the front and rear video is in that same file. The manner in which the AVI files are created by the GX1000 containing the front and rear video in the same video file makes it a little bit more difficult to play with traditional video players on a PC or Mac. FiveView does provide a player of its own that is capable of playing the AVI file without having to do anything to it. You just mount the micro SD on your Windows PC or your Mac, and you can use the FindView player to access that information. If you're going to access them through another player, I found on Windows, I was able to use the VLC player and it can access track one or track two, track one being the front and track two being the rear video stream. So you can access it that way as well. Using the FindView Android or iOS app, you can connect to the GX1000 over a Wi-Fi connection and you can play the video content. You can also download the video content. You'll have a choice when you select a particular video file for download, whether to download the entire file, the AVI file that's on the micro SD card, but that will not be playable directly on your phone device. You have the option also picking the front only or the rear only video. And when it downloads it on an Android device, it will create an MP4 file that's playable on your Android device. If you're on an iOS device, it'll download it as an MOV file. At the end of the download phase, you'll see a converting statement on the screen, and it's converting the downloaded content to an MOV file for your iOS device. 
In the Features and Functions section, I wanted to point out the AI damage detection feature for the GX1000. This is supposed to filter out light impacts that occur during parking mode and also identify where they occur. Now they will still record videos, but it won't announce them to you. In my testing, I found that it really didn't announce anything, even if the impact was quite severe. So I don't know how well this particular feature works since it doesn't seem to work very well for me. The other feature is the AI heat detection feature. While it's in parking mode, if the camera begins to overheat, it will power down the dash camera into power saving mode and then wait for the camera to cool down enough to where it can restore the power and return to the parking mode that you selected. If you have any questions about the features I've listed for the FineView GX1000 or the VFO A229 Duo, please let me know in the comment section for this video. I provided this document to the Fine Digital Marketing Department and the VFO Marketing Department to confirm that the information contained in this document is accurate, and they both agreed that the information is accurate for their products. When I review a dash camera, I perform a series of power consumption tests to have an idea how much power it consumes in the normal recording modes, or in the case of the Fine View GX1000, it calls it driving recording modes, and in the various parking modes. In the notes column, I document any interesting attributes I discover while testing that particular recording mode, and mainly since the documentation for the Find UGX 1000 doesn't document the various recording modes and where the files are stored, I'm going through and noting that in the notes column in this particular one. This is for the driving recording modes, and here we are in the smart time lapse. And then we have the 15 frames per second, which is basically the same as standard, except it records at 15 frames per second rather than 30 frames per second as it does in standard mode. On this page, I'm documenting the three primary parking modes of motion, smart time lapse, and 15 frames per second. Motion and 15 frames per second are both motion based parking modes, while smart time lapse is a continuously recording parking mode at two frames per second. And again, I'm documenting where the videos are stored, any bitrate information, and the total length. The interesting thing to note about Smart Time Lapse Parking Mode is when an impact does occur, it does not stop the Smart Time Lapse recording itself. It creates an impact recording of 20 seconds and it continues the Smart Time Lapse recording as well. Any of the motion based or impact recordings are buffered recordings of 20 seconds, 10 seconds before the triggering event, and 10 seconds after the triggering event. On this screen, I'm documenting the amount of power consumed in the power saving parking mode, and also when you turn off the GX1000 with the power switch. In power saving parking mode, it will go into the slow power consumption mode and it waits for an impact, but it does take 5.6 seconds on average in my testing to start the camera recording again, not the 1.9 seconds as documented on the 5V website. So keep that in mind in making your evaluation whether that's quick enough to start recording when an impact is detected. After the power saving parking mode impact is recorded, it does go into a surveillance mode for 60 seconds, or if it occurs where there is continuous motion in that period of time, it will last up to 66 seconds. And then once that completes, it will return to power saving parking mode, irrespective of whether motion is continuing within the field of view of the cameras. And the last item on this list is the turning off of the GX1000 using the power slide switch on the side of it. And that's useful if you return home and you don't need it to be recording in parking mode while parked in your garage. You want to conserve your vehicle's battery or your dash cam battery pack. You can slide it to the off position, but it does still consume about 0.05 watts in that mode. Here are my parking mode time estimates based on the power consumption data that I gathered and displayed in the previous screens for the various parking modes for the VineView GX1000 two channel dash camera. And I'm showing you two columns here for the 76.8 watt hour dash cam battery packs that are on the market and a 96 watt hour dash cam battery pack. For those various modes, you can see, of course, the power saving parking mode where it goes into a deep sleep mode until an impact occurs is a clear winner. But it does take the 5.6 seconds to wake up in my testing, not the 1.9 seconds as displayed on the 5U website. So keep that in mind in making your choice whether that's sufficient for your needs. And you can see the time estimates here and see if those are appropriate for your parking recording needs. In this section of the video, I'm going to show you some video samples from the FineView GX1000 dash cameras that I have in my vehicle for this review. I'll show you some daytime examples, nighttime examples, parking, driving recording, smart time lapse. And at the end, I'll show you a plate capture example at night 
and also a backlit sign that I've been using in the last couple of reviews. Please be aware I do have a separate video showing some additional video samples from the FineView GX1000 and you want to check the video description section for the link to that video or I'll place the link in the upper right corner. I'll be driving by a roadside sign that is backlit and with that I'll be demonstrating how well the FineView GX1000 HDR feature works compared to other cameras. For the five different dash cameras that I had on the front windshield, I've gone through each of the video files from them and selected the best video frame that demonstrates how it best captured that roadside sign. And based on that, you can see that the FineView GX1000 rear dash camera that's on the front windshield actually captured it the best. FindView claims that the front and rear are both HDR enabled when that setting is turned on. And you can see that the FindView front dash camera with the HDR turned on is second best. And then it kind of goes downhill from there. Even with the VFO A229 having the WDR feature on, it doesn't really capture that sign very well. This is test loop number two of the backlit roadside sign. The only difference in this test is the VFO A229 has the WDR feature turned off. I only have one of those dash cameras, so I needed to run two test loops to complete this test. Once again, the FindView GX1000 rear dash camera on the front windshield actually does the best. The FindView GX1000 front with HDR turned on does second best, and then the others just really don't capture the sign at all. In this test, I'm gonna see how well the four dash cameras on the screen here, the two FindView front dash cameras and the rear version on the front windshield and the VFO A229 capture a plate on the vehicle directly in front of me. In this example, I've zoomed the video footage by 500% for all four dash cameras, and I have selected the best video frame, but there really wasn't much of a difference since both my vehicle and that vehicle were stationary at the time of this particular test. And the characters that are blurred are the third and fourth characters for privacy reasons. And in the case of the VFO A229 on the bottom, the blurred characters are similar to the characters to the right of the blurred characters, whereas for the FindView GX1000 cameras, the blurred characters are more similar to the second character in this example. In addition, please note that my vehicle's headlamps are shining at the base of this plate, not on the full plate. My rankings for this plate capture test would go first place to the FindView GX1000 front camera with HDR turned on, then second place is the rear camera for that same dash camera with HDR turned on, then the HDR off version of the FindView GX1000 front camera doesn't capture it all that well. And then the first two characters of the VFO A229 are captured really well, but the remainder of the plate is pretty poor. So it comes in fourth place in my opinion. All the other nighttime plate capture tests that I ran driving in various lighting conditions were all worse than this particular example. So this is the best case example. If it's in motion, it really doesn't capture lights very well in any of these uh, four dash cameras that were on the front windshield. So with that, that concludes this video sample section. In this section, I'm gonna show you the installation of the FindView Wi-Fi app on an iOS device and an Android 10 device. 
I'll show you some of the configuration settings you can configure with the GX1000 dash camera using that app and some of the other functionality in the app. This is the installation of the FindView Wi-Fi app on an iOS device, and it was not capturing this very first permission screen in a screen recording, so that's why I'm taking these external phone pictures. So you can see all of the prompts for the permissions, including the very first one. The very first time you use the FindView Wi-Fi app to connect to the camera, you need to select the non-LCD dash cam because it has no screen, and the iOS version of the app drops you into the FindView Wi-Fi settings instead of the Wi-Fi section. I asked Find Digital why this was the case, and they said per Apple, any app in the App Store needs to drop the user into the app settings instead of the Wi-Fi section directly. And if it's the first connection to the dash camera, you'll need to enter the password, which is default 12345678. And when you navigate back to the app, it will then prompt you with this additional network access setting. And then it will go through the app setting for the language for the dash camera, which the default is English. Even though the screen doesn't state it, this is the speed camera selection, and you can select up to five regions. The defaults are Australia, Japan, and the United States. Then the app will prompt you whether you wish to receive push notifications. And then if you agree to that, you go to the next question, which is about having the permission granted to the app for that. And then after this prompt, you'll be dropped into the main screen for the app. I'm going to switch over to Android version of the installation to show you that as well. And invoking the app, we get prompted for permissions as well. And we're asked for location permissions, and it's asking for the device's location while using the app. And then we get the same request about sending notifications. And here's the main screen. We're going to try to connect to the device. Again, the non-LCD version. We select the SSID of the device by pressing the button to activate the Wi-Fi on the camera. And I have previously connected to this dash camera on this device, so there isn't a need to put in the password information. And here we go for the language and the speed camera information again. And then here's the main screen. So now I'm going into settings. And then the first one I'll go into is environment. And within environment, we have the ability to define the Wi-Fi password, the speed unit, the on-screen display of the speed, the rear camera record direction, the security LED, whether it's off, always on, or only on in parking. If you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you can change the status LED brightness, which are the two LEDs by the buttons on the front camera. And you can change that from auto, which I have, to level three, because I found auto to be a bit dim. Then if we navigate back up to the top and go into the camera section, you can define whether the HDR feature, high dynamic range recording, is enabled. By default, it is off. In this camera, I've turned that on. And the rear video brightness, and that is set to standard by default. Next, we go back up to the top level and go into memory card. You can define how the memory partition is handled on the micro SD card. You have driving priority, event priority, parking priority, and driving only. And then you can set override protections on the lower part of the screen and I set it back to driving priority, which is the default. Then we go into record options, and within record options, you have driving recording and parking recording options. Within driving recording, you can select standard, smart time-lapse, or 15 frames per second. You can also define the event sensitivity for impact events. I set it to low, and it was still too sensitive, and I'm working with Find Digital to see if that can be refined in a later firmware release. And then within the parking recording section, you click on the tab on the top, and then you can select the type of parking mode recording you would like. Motion, smart time lapse, 15 frames per second, which is still a motion-based recording type, and then the power saving parking recording type, which is the low power consumption mode. The impact events, you can set the sensitivity to that with the event sensitivity setting, which the default is mid, and then the motion sensitivity, which is also the default value of mid. Next is the anti-flicker setting, which is off by default, and I left it off. It will change the frames per second to 27 instead of 30. When you scroll to the bottom of the screen, you can see the record quality setting again, and it's set to high quality. You can then scroll back up to the main section for settings, and you can then go into the voice guidance. In this section, you define what announcements are made by the GX1000, and if you decide to disconnect the rear camera, make sure you disable the rear camera announcement, otherwise you'll be notified of that every time the GX1000 powers up. Go back up to the top section, and then go into the ADAS and safe driving settings. 
Now you can turn these on. These are on by default. And I found them to be a little bit annoying, especially when you're doing the lane departure warning and you're changing lanes. It doesn't know you have your turn signal on. So I tend to turn these off in any of the dash cameras that have these features. But if you like that type of feature, make sure you configure the settings to your likings in the screen. Navigate back up and then navigate down into the power section. And when I enter this particular one, since I have the low voltage setting already set to only auxiliary battery, since I have it connected to a dash cam battery pack, this pop-up is just trying to remind you that you have it set to that and you may be able to discharge your vehicle's battery if you have it configured that way and not connected to an auxiliary battery or a dash cam battery pack. Clicking OK on the pop-up, we get to the actual settings here for the low voltage settings and hybrid. I'm not exactly 100% clear what that means because most hybrid vehicles have a lead acid battery that's driving the accessories and they're usually of small capacity. So I'm not quite sure what you would select there, but you have these options for that setting. Moving down to the cutoff time settings, this by default is set to 48 hours and I don't necessarily want to limit my particular parking mode session to 48 hours, so I've changed it to off, but you can set it to where you have a low voltage cutoff and a time setting as well. Back up on the top of the setting screen, on the upper right, we have the time setting. In there, you can define the time zone for the dash camera and also whether daylight saving time is active at this point in time of the year. Next, you can go back up and define the sound level for the speaker and you can toggle it through off, one, two, three, or four. And the last setting on this page is the mic setting and that determines whether audio is recorded or not by the GX1000. And then we move back up to the main screen. In the upper right corner is the update section. It shows the connected device type, whether update notifications are to be enabled for version updates, and then the speed camera, firmware, dash camera language, and the app version is presented here. If there is an update available, it will prompt you to potentially update the device with that particular version, and you can use this to update your dash camera using the app over the Wi-Fi connection. Please be aware that the FindView Wi-Fi app is connected to a single dash camera device at any one time. If you need to connect to a different device, you go into the update section, click on the initialize connected device and tell it to reset it. Then when you go to connect it again to a dash camera, it'll go through the initial connection to any dash camera. It could be the same one or a different one, but it is associated with one FindView dash camera at any point in time. Now I'm going to walk through the dash cam file feature, which stops the current video recording and lists the files on the micro SD card. You have the available filters on the top of the screen, including a date filter. And then you can scroll through the available files there and those files with the FR are for front and rear. It begins to play back the front by default and you can select rear as well. And you can change the zoom factor or download the video file. I'm downloading the front video file. I'm compressing the time frame here. To show you the total time frame, it's using a 2.4 uh, gigahertz Wi-Fi connection, and at the end it converts it over to an MOV file when it's done on an iOS device. And here's the rear file. On an Android device, it would download the video file into an MP4 file instead of an MOV file like it does on an iOS device. So those two files are now downloaded, and I'm going to go back and select the download of the full file itself, the original video file, which is an AVI file. And that will actually go a little bit quicker than the other two because it's not extracting the video stream from the file on the micro SD card. And then we've completed that. We can click OK and we've completed that download. And now I'm going to go ahead and exit back to the file listing and go back up to the top level here. And then I'm going to go into the downloaded video section and you can see the video files that you've downloaded. And if you click on it, it begins playing that from the local file cache where they've been stored. And here's that information for one of those files that I downloaded. The OR means that it's the rear file. And then you can go through the various files that you've downloaded. And then there's the event summary section. So on that same trip on March 31st, I'm going to navigate back to the last week worth of events. And you can see the driving and parking and impact events that took place during that particular trip. In this Q&A section, I'm going through various questions I had while reviewing the dash camera. And the main one that I had for this particular GX1000 is what do the various parking modes actually do or how are the impacts or manual recording events handled? And in this page, I actually define that. On the left side, I define the types of events that occur and the type of recording files that get created and where they're stored. And on the right side, I define under driving recording mode, 
for the various selections you have available there when it, a, an event takes place, what happens. Then below that, the parking recording modes, which include the motion and 15 frames per second, which are both motion based, and then the smart time lapse recording mode. Down on the bottom on the right, we have the power saving parking mode, and that's a different variation. It's not the same as the others, and there's a sequence of steps that it goes through when it enters power saving parking modes. So pause the video, check out this page to hopefully have a better understanding of how the various parking modes or driving recording modes handle the various events that might occur in those modes. Now let's move on to page two of my Q&A. And I have a question about what type of power adapters are supported for the FineView GX1000. There are two currently on the market and the third one, the FineView OBD2 power cable is coming soon from FineView. And right now, the parking mode is only supported with the three-wire hardware cable. And once the OBD2 power cable is available, you'll have another option. Parking mode does not work with the cigarette lighter adapter powering the dash camera. The next section, I have the information reported on the on-screen status line. So I have an example line there and the various field values there, and I explain what those are. Moving on to the next question, which is also related to parking mode support for the CLA or OBD2 power adapter. In question one on this page, I already stated that the CLA doesn't support parking mode, so that's still true here. But the thing I'm identifying here is the OBD2 power adapter has internal logic within it to detect the input voltage from the vehicle to know when to transition into parking mode and when to transition back into driving mode, and also has a certain number of minutes it must wait before no mo while no motion is detected or motion has been detected. So check out the answer on the right side to see what the future OBD2 power adapter logic would be for parking mode support. The next question is related to the smart time lapse term that you see and documented for the GX1000. It's a driving recording mode and a parking recording mode, and they're both recorded at 2560 by 1440 resolution. But in driving recording mode, it records six frames per second, but it plays back at 30 frames per second. So that's why it looks um, quicker than real time when you play it back. And it records a 60 second video file. So a 60 second video file in driving recording mode will equal five minutes of wall clock time or driving time. In parking recording mode, you have the same resolution, but at two frames per second. And the 20 second video file that it creates, so it creates multiple 20 second video files. And each 20 second video file is equal to five minutes of parking time. The last question on this page is related to an issue I found when mounting the front dash cameras on the windshield. I found that the cradle mount joint that connects to the front dash camera actually was loose, allowing the dash camera to move around. I'm showing on the screen some video where I was able to easily move the dash camera, and my solution to it was temporarily, until FindView finds a solution for this, is to put some thin automotive felt. I had some noise reduction felt from a noise reduction kit I had and place it on two of the tabs that connect into the GX1000 dash camera. And that resolved the problem. But check it out, see if you have that problem with yours. And you can have a simple solution like that, at least temporarily, based on the thing I tried. And so far it's been working just fine. If you have a question about your FindView GX1000 that you don't see answered in this Q&A section, leave a comment to this video and I'll try to answer your question as soon as possible. Here are my final thoughts for the FindView GX1000 dash camera. Start off with the pros. It's a 2K quad high definition 2560 by 1440 video resolution front and rear dash camera. It has high dynamic range HDR support for both the front and rear cameras. And I'm glad to see that it actually has an on off switch. And this particular one also protects the micro SD card from being removed while the dash camera is powered on. And it contains a smart time lapse feature, which in driving recording mode records at six frames per second, and in parking mode will record at two frames per second. And the interesting thing to note there is in smart time lapse mode, if an impact occurs while that's recording, the smart time lapse continues to record and it creates the impact recording as well. The status line has a black background, which makes it visible in various lighting conditions. The status line is at the top of the video. Sometimes I might like to see that at the bottom of the video because some of the things that are stationary in the field of view are the dashboard, so I might like to see that at the bottom. But it might be nice to have a user settable setting in the firmware settings to position that either at the top or the bottom. Find Digital does provide the Find View Player 2.0, 
which you can download for Windows PCs or Macs. And using that, you can play back the video generated by the GX1000. Again, it's a slightly unique format where it's an AVI file that contains both the front and rear video streams in the one file. You can use the FindView player to extract the front or rear video into its own file using the FindView player as well. Now let's move on to my list of cons for the FindView GX1000. The first one being that there's currently no CPL filter for the front dash camera. I've spoken to Find Digital about this and they say they are working on it. Customer feedback and my feedback, they've taken that into consideration and they're working on such a thing right now. I don't have an estimated date for that becoming available, but they are still working on it and hopefully it will be available soon. The next item on my list of cons is the fact that I ran into a problem while installing the two GX1000s on my front windshield. I found that the cradle joint mount for the windshield mount actually was loose when connecting into the GX1000 camera body. And this is fully clipped in. Fully clipped in. And I have some video showing that movement that I found in that. I ended up resolving the issue by installing some automotive noise reduction felt. And then I notified Find Digital of the issue. They were unaware of the issue and they're checking on it. It may just be the units I received, but it's something I ran into while testing out this dash camera. Next item on the list of cons is the AI parking mode, which is touted as a feature of this dash camera. I found it doesn't work very well. And why I say it doesn't work very well is because for the three general parking modes of motion, smart time lapse, and 15 frames per second, which is also a motion based parking mode, it seems to filter out virtually everything. I never get notified of a severe impact and I ran a test where I did a severe impact of the windshield and it never notified me of it. The power saving parking mode operates in a different fashion. It doesn't use the AI filtering and it does notify me when an impact occurs, the number of impacts, and if it exceeds 10, it tells you over 10. And if there's any motion events that occur in the surveillance mode, it tells you the number of events. And again, if it goes over 10, you'll say over 10. So I'd like to have the ability to turn off the AI parking mode filtering for the other three parking modes or add some sort of user settable setting where you can define the sensitivity level for the AI filtering logic. Because right now in my testing, it's not reporting anything to me for those three main parking mode recording types. The next item is the driving recording mode event sensitivity setting. I set it to low because I have a lot of bumpy roads in my area and usually the other dash cameras in my vehicle don't notify about those impact events over the bumpy road. The GX1000 was notifying constantly. I notified Find Digital of the issue and I've seen this in other reviews of the GX1000 where that sensitivity setting just wasn't working well. I've been provided a couple test versions and I think we have a solution in an updated firmware that will hopefully be available to the public fairly soon. The next item on the list is price. The FindView GX1000 goes for $300 US dollars and the VFO A229 Duo goes for $260 US dollars, sometimes on sale for $220 US dollars. Is the FindView GX1000 worth the extra money? Yes and no, it depends on what features you're going after, the power saving parking mode, if that's important to you, that's something unique to the GX1000. The VFO A229 Duo has a couple extra features. It has the availability of a CPL filter right now, and it also has a Bluetooth remote you can use to lock the currently recording video so you don't have to try to find the button on the dash camera itself while you're driving. Is the FindView GX1000 worth the extra money compared to the VFO A229 Duo? Only you can decide based on the feature comparison. Next item on my list of cons is really not a con, but the fact that it's showing the age of the products that the FindView GX1000 and the VFO A229 Duo are still using the Sony Starvis IMX335 image sensors. The new Sony Starvis 2 image sensors are available. It'd be nice to see both products updated with that new version of the image sensor for better quality and potentially better HDR support. The last con on the list for the FindView GX1000 is the fact that it uses a slightly unique approach to storing the video for both the front and rear cameras in one video file. You can extract them using the FindView app or you can use the FindView player and extract them into separate files. But if you have to submit the file from the dash camera unaltered to an insurance company or a law enforcement agency, they may not understand how to play that, both the front and rear channels from that same video file. You'd have to explain that those players are available and there's ways to get to it. 
but it's a different approach where most other dash cameras have a separate video file that is written for each of the video channels front, rear in this particular case. So that completes my list of the pros and cons for the FindView GX1000. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. I appreciate your time taking to view this video. If this has been helpful to you, making an informed choice on whether the FindView GX1000 is the dash camera for you, make sure you hit that like button. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Hit that bell notification to be notified when I upload new videos just like this. If you decided you want to purchase the FindView GX1000, make sure you check out the video's description section. I'll have affiliate links down there, and if you use my affiliate links for Black Box My Car, you'll save 5% on your purchase over $250 US or $300 Canadian. If you use one of my affiliate links to make a purchase, it will not cost you anything extra, and it will make a small contribution to the channel to cover the cost of doing reviews just like this. Thanks for coming to the channel and checking out the video. See you in the next one.